ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to bring to you, what do you call this? Live all the way from Chicago, Tom Foreman, and uh, who is an old friend of our college. As a matter of fact, uh, when he came first year, he really liked the place so much that he endorsed his daughter, Barbara, to study here. She's sitting here in the second row. And he became a good friend, a good friend of our college. As a matter of fact, several people worked in his office, and the person who's introducing Tom Foreman to you tonight is Andrew Fisher, fifth year student who spent some time in the office, as did others. And so without any further ado, Emily will introduce to you Tom Foreman. I was fortunate enough to intern in Tom's office last fall in Chicago. He is principal of a firm called Chicago Associates Planners and Architects. And Arlene Serrano, who is also a fifth year architect architecture student, interned the following semester. The majority of Tom's work deals with socially and environmentally responsive issues. For five years, he served as the national president of ADPSR, which is Architects, Designers, and Planners for Social Responsibility. A current project that he's been working on in his office is Tryon Farm, which is an ecological, ecological community in Michigan City, dealing with issues in ecological restoration and community building. In addition to being principal of his firm, Tom teaches architecture at the University of Illinois Chicago. I consider my internship with Tom to have been one of the most valuable experiences that I've ever had. The many roles that he plays as a practitioner, educator, and consultant opened my eyes to more than I ever thought possible. He fights to bring sustainability into the mainstream of Chicago, something that few architects have attempted to do. His commitment to a connection with the schools is evident in the classes he teaches and the interns he brings into his office. And his dedication to social responsibility is shown through his continued research in low-income housing alternatives and homeless issues. Above all, Tom's enthusiasm and creativity made it, made it an exciting challenge to work with him. Um, he's here to share his thoughts and ideas with us tonight, and I hope that you learn as much from him as I did. Now, I'm proud to produce, <laughs> present Tom. Thank you. Well, it's nice to be uh, back at Ball State again. Without a lot of introduction, let's just get down to it. Now, one of the things I would encourage all of you tonight is this is not a frozen lecture. Uh, I'm not going out these exit doors immediately after finishing the lights. I really would like some conversation because these things I want to talk about tonight are things that have been rattling around in my brain recently. And I would really appreciate some help in shaping them uh, as a part of tonight's conversation. So, it's not the sort of, yeah, I've got a couple of minutes for a few questions. I've got a few years for a few comments. It's more like that. So if we could have the lights and then we can. The more I think about it, I'm not only from Chicago, I am Chicago. I'm incredibly shaped by it in my being. And what's interesting to me if I look at it, this part of that is that my life also rests somewhere between Hoppy and Jerry. And it's been shaped by both of these, as well as between my father and my children, as well as the things that I've done in my life, both from a public point of view and a private point of view. The building on the left here is the building that kept me out of the Army during the height of the Vietnam War and a national deferment. I worked with 12 welfare mothers. You know those, those are those shiftless, lazy people. And we found a way that they could buy this building, rehab this building. And it's hard to see, but this is the little plaque up there. It actually has my name on it. <laughs> and this is on the west side of Chicago. About the same little bit after, I made a place for my children. And I always had this feeling that somehow 
As a child, I really wanted to have an adventure as I lived. And my children lived in that mail truck in an old garage. And as we moved on in our life and moved into a house, the children decided that they wanted their room designed like a mail truck so that they could live together. Both of these, I think, are really important themes about speaking about the issues of what we want to talk about tonight. Because I want to talk to you about something that's been rattling around in my mind. I was a student of Saul Alinsky, a social organizer. Some of you might have heard of him. He wrote a book called Rules for Rad Radicals, hence the lecture title, Rules for Radishes. He was an important man in my life because what he spoke about was the importance for citizens to realize that they could make a difference. And I'm beginning to realize that through our efforts as architects and planners and landscape architects, we have to remember that we can make a difference. And we are at a point in time, a much less violent point in time, than many of us in this room were at at the end of the 60s, which is that after the turmoil of the Vietnam War, we found ourselves being able to address social issues in a positive framework. I see today a similar challenge before us as the rivers of social responsibility and environmental responsibility begin to come together on their way to the ocean. And a good friend of mine gave me these two, this slide, which is a picture of his two daughters' birthday party. And I have to tell you the stories of these two young daughters because I think it's probably symbolic of this whole conversation of understanding constellations. Gar Sheriff and his wife tried to have a baby for 10 years. They couldn't have one. They were able to adopt a baby. Three months after they had all the papers signed and the baby was on the way, Lorraine discovered she was pregnant. So there are only two people I know in my whole life who have two kids that are five months apart. And they brought up their whole life this way. And as Garth calls them, they're his twins. And I like to think of this birthday picture as an expression of that. So what we're going to try to look at tonight are some of the issues that I think that Alinsky opened some doors to us about. But one of the key things, and we talked about it in Scott's studio today, is Sal had this thing about the importance of words and the power of words. And that if you set them, you have meant them. And I'd like you, as you look through these slides, be seeing five words. Power self-interest, compromise, conflict, and ego. Not as negative terms, but as positive terms of how you can begin to perform in the future. Also, the slides are organized in a way in which there are two slides that come up first. Are the challenges that I see, there's five challenges that we're going to be talking about tonight. Then there's a series of experiences that I personally have had that interrelate to those in terms of the work I've been doing. And then finally, there's a series of discussions of tactics for the future, which really is the work that my students have been introducing me to through their insight and their involvement. Housing. Two weeks ago in the New York Times, these two photographs appeared in the same newspaper. There was something about this that if you were in a negative mood, you would say it would be an indictment of our profession. On one hand, people are living, Chinese people are living this way. And on the other hand, designers are creating a discreet ornamental, ornament there. I can't even think about it, it gets me so upset. But the reality of it is that somehow we're living in this duality of worlds. But it even gets worse than this, because in the midst of this seven, six part series, they talked about the crisis that was going on within New York's administration that people had to deal with housing on a day to day basis. Because there are people in New York city government who are responsible to make sure that the homeless find a place to live and that these types of places stay available because it's better than being homeless. And on the same side of the other side of the coin, there's groups of people in the administration who are dealing with the issue by saying, that's not safe. We have to get people out of those points of view. And to see that those two things are in conflict with each other, and at the same time being held up with this discussion of style over substance, is a critical issue that all of you as students, whether you be a planner, a landscape architect, or an architect, are going to be dealing with your life. 
We're currently working on a project in Rockwell Gardens, in the west side of Chicago. It's a whole six project, which is uh, a euphemism of HUDs that was created to say, gee, you get the plan and there's good hope for what's going to happen. All of it, though, is being done under the popular image of what should happen to public housing. Blow it up. Dump it. High rises are bad. All of it forgets something. People do live in those buildings. They're invested in those buildings. And the only legislation that we're doing in three different forms is tearing all those buildings down. This is all deja vu to me, because in 1955, I was involved in some working with neighborhood groups when I was a social worker around the University of Chicago, where people were living in three flat brick buildings. And there's a famous photograph that shows those buildings being torn down. And Julian Levy, who was a well-known planner who just died last week, who was the head of the uh, University of Chicago Redevelopment, standing proudly in front of the buildings with a model of a Rockwell Gardens building, saying, we're tearing down these three flats in order to build these better buildings. Last Thursday, I was at a conference with Chris Lee, who's the architect responsible for building some of the replacement housing after you blow it down. And Chris, to his credit, stood before the audience and said, I hope that my six-year-old son doesn't come back here 34 years from now with photographs of this new idea for a building and with my buildings being torn down in front of me. The issue, as hard as it might be to leave, is not about the architecture. The issue, rather, is about beginning to develop visions that can relate to the community and allow them truly to take on the responsibility of planning. We have created in our society a series of institutions which believe that because they are paid great sums of money, they know what's best. Our roles as architects, planners and landscape architects, is begin to evolve strategies that will allow people to set their own agendas, to be able to set their own lives and plan their own situations. This type of activity is key to the kind of involvement we're working on in the Rockwell Hope 6 plan. One of the examples of this is that we found out by doing a detailed study of the physical buildings that the power plant there is sized uh, to support four times the number of units that it's currently taken care of. They just renewed this building entirely. At the same time, we discovered that every one of the buildings in Rockwell Gardens have south-facing exterior gallery corridors. So what we're working on is, rather than the image of tearing these buildings down, is how do you begin to marry the power plant that's under south, underutilized and these incredible south-facing facades and begin to talk about how do you integrate into them businesses from the point of view of landscape, be they hydroponic gardens, be they other types of activities that use the physical constraints that what are there, rather than deal with the secretary of HUD who has said there shall be no more housing, almost like a dictum from the high. So the planning deals with how to begin to knit these existing high-rises, the light blue, with new forms of housing so as to improve the environment for people to live. We did a survey of the 2,000 people who lived here. As you walk around and talk to them, more than 50% want to stay living in the buildings. They have no compunction about whether they're high-rise, low-rise. They feel that this is their community. It's a hard thing to realize when you realize that all you're looking at on the ground, that is the community. And people, though, have, have a, a feeling about it. They want to participate in it. So what we try to do is understand what the assets of a community are and build from those assets. And we have a lot of models, really, to build on in terms of precedence. This is a land use map of a typical Chicago neighborhood that happens to include Rockwell Gardens. Each of those colors represents a variety of uses. Look at the kind of blend of things and, and how it all works. On the other hand, what's happening to Chicago today is a, a drive to homogenize everything. Big blobs of red, big blobs of green, big blobs of yellow. And then people wonder, well, why don't people uh, really like staying here anymore? And an image that I try to always bring back up is the Queen Mary, which was floating between the towers when I was talking about let's have a vision. 
Because when you look at the Queen Mary, you take a look at its structure, its section, and you realize that the yellow is the housing portion of the Queen Mary, and all of the other colors are the supports that are required. And then you suddenly realize that none of that exists within the confines of a Rockwell. But it does consist, exist within the two-dimensional land use plan that we see us before on this map. So how do we begin to do this? What do we use for precedence? What do we use for models? This is a building we did about 20 years ago. It's a monastery in Port Blair, in Hidden Hills, uh, Illinois. Fabulously interesting building. It sits literally between all those houses as you see it. Uh, monastery, if you don't know about it, is sort of a self-contained, self-supporting, organized community with all of the different services and housing and everything else. And this particular group were artisans and they manufactured everything they had to do. Just so that you know that architecture isn't a perfect story. This building was torn down last year. I flew over it on the way to Lafayette yesterday. You cannot see the difference any longer that the building was there. The scourge of the suburban houses have swept across the entirety of it. That even the woods, which was protected, is gone. So we have to be considerate of these types of situations and try then to react to what we have available to us now. This is a project of one of my uh, interns, Shalini Algram. She has worked with me in the office. This project is actually being uh, built as we, or being done as we speak, which was through a series of independent fundings. We've created what is known as the Community Transit Service to connect a series of social services on the near west side that provide uh, help for young mothers who are either going to school, having to go to the doctor, or go to their jobs. Because it's not enough to say you get a job, but how do you take your kid to daycare? How do you get to the job? How do you get back? If the CTA as a grid system disconnects things, how do you take and develop a transit system that really is a community-based transit system? And we've got three buses donated by the Blue Cross Blue Shield, and we're beginning service this fall. Very exciting project is where I'm concerned. What it really starts to do is to dress in an organizational fabric how these issues of housing can start to be blended together by making sure that we utilize the assets of the community as strongly as possible. Community building. You know, there's several projects that I think lots of us have been familiar with around this, the country. And this is just one in Chicago in which young people are given a chance to uh, work on small projects to improve their community. Today in Scott's studio, at the end, I challenged the studio's students to make an intervention at the end of their class. I said, okay, you're now studying Ball State. Find something that you can do in two hours that will make a representation of people that whatever you worked on can work. And make it happen. Take two hours and make it happen. It can be done. And these young people in their community are doing it. And young architects like Neil Gaffney are working with students to take and develop the little things that just make them have a feeling about their community. And they're working in the schools with students as, as architects. Uh, whether it be working with an individual student, such as the young man on the side who is in, perhaps many of you can uh, relate to his look on his face. It's probably what you feel like uh, every night before a jury that's going to come up. Uh, Developing ideas about buildings that he should have in his neighborhood, or this wonderful project for a, a playground in which the playground was already built by the sort of authorities to be, and what they did is they came in and created these student-built totems around it in order to make a, a public place out of it. This was done by young students who are in the sixth and seventh grade, working with young architects who are working in the community. Uh, many years ago, an old partner of mine, Nicholas Morgenthaler, discussed the concept that he thought there should be something known as barefoot architects. It was about the time of when the barefoot doctors in China were going on, and Nicholas thought that was the next thing. I had the experience last fall, almost to the day, of becoming a bare hands architect. And part of that had to do with developing a kind of a sense of natural building materials and a, a sense of appropriate technology is based upon getting to know things and getting to know the different kinds of materials that are available, beginning to work with wood, beginning to work with straw bale, beginning to work with cob, which one of the, you know, 
If any of you are going to psychologists or psychiatrists at the present time, I just recommend that you throw that on the side and become a copper. Uh, it is the most incredible experience to, it, it made me a whole person. And I'm like, I was supposed to go this week because they're having a second one and I'm here instead, I'm really glad to be here. But I, I sort of like got this cop fix that I need to get taken care of somewhere along. It's just a wonderful experience of being able to work with other people and share experiences. But the most important thing is you really become in touch with your body. Uh, I know that's done in other ways, but this is something I've liked. Um, the, uh, the other thing, too, is uh, you, know, you get to work with filling sandbags and building buildings, making sticks to make walls, just sort of fabulous stuff that ends up creating domes, creating timber frames, creating sewerage systems, creating very interesting sort of hand-built solar steam generators. And But what it's all about, more than these technologies, these individual events, more than these technologies being uh, appropriate, I think the real strength of it for me rose out of the fact that it really was a building of a community together. And then when I came back and with my students last semester, I was so charged up that I created a project called Home Intervention. They were charged to go to their houses, apartments, wherever they were rent, and they had to build, in two weeks' time, an intervention that reflected what was appropriate to what was needed in their particular setting. We had 19 students who lived from 35 miles outside of Chicago to the inner city of Chicago. On one Saturday, in a big bus, we had a jury of 30 people, the 19 students, a catered affair. We did 300 miles in 12 hours. Visit every one of those settings, and within that, built this incredible community on that bus because we were on and off in 15 minutes each time. They got a chance to experience how students could build and design within the realm of their own community but at the same time expose us to the possibilities of building a broader community by beginning to do small-scale design build. I know here at Ball State we've been very fortunate through the years of, of having this type of experience in a little bit bigger projects, but I was really fascinated with the ability of just going in a very small project making things happen. I, I just have to take a moment then and say with my magic wand, this was a great project. See those cardboard tubes? This is a vacant lot in Bucktown, two buildings on either side. And the young architect came up with this idea. If you would come and stare through the tubes, you would see the siding and the imperfection of the siding on each wall, each side. But through the tube, it became magnified. And through that, you became aware of this space in a way that you never would have had a chance to. Jaywon Shin, a young Japanese student, did this project, which he probably could when I'm a millionaire of. It's a shade. He lived in a very small apartment with a very light sunlight coming through it. He, he the crafted this shade and shapes to reflect the space that was outside of it. Justin Busey had three dogs. He created this machine to water them. Uh, we'll leave that to last because it's the best. Uh, this project over here was a series of strings that people had to change it. It was the most incredible thing because it was the first project we did in a day and everybody got like totally energized by it. This was a project where a young man in Naperville, a far suburban community, rebuilt his grandma's swing that she always went out every night to swing on in the same place and commemorated to her in her favor. This young man lives in Crystal Lake and he discovered once we told him, go out in your backyard and look around and see what's out there, he found this old stone fireplace that had been totally wrapped around by vines. And he then also discovered the power company had cut down trees across the street. And he came and built a mound of twigs around the fireplace, relit the fireplace that had always been there. And we all were saying, oh, that fireplace must have been there in the backyard. You know, that just happens. But the more he dug around and talked to people, he discovered that fireplace was a part and twin to the fireplace in the house next door. And lo and behold, where two houses are now, it used to be one house, he suddenly became totally informed about the place he grew up and spent his whole life in by just doing this kind of design build project. Again, doing a community building project helps you to identify who you are. And once you know who you are, as an Alinsky saying goes, you're able then to help organize others. Remember that word, self-confidence.
Now, I'm sort of really interested in this whole idea of hype versus reality. I found these two weekends ago in the New York Times. New York Times is like a grazing ground if you're going to do a lecture, by the way. You just go in there and look around, and you might not know where you're going, but as soon as enough you get some images, it'll help you. And I think these two issues about technology are really rather interesting to, to explore and to see how we can work. And I also think that they're also interesting to me because they help me learn more about trusting people themselves. This is Lunt Avenue on the Red Line in Chicago. A group of people, just neighborhood people, got together and decided, hey, we need a better health stop. So what they did is they painted a mural, everybody brought a chair they had laying around the house somewhere, and they created an health stop. You know, that kind of idea needs to be addressed, and we're working currently on a project at the end of the, the Brown Line called the Kimball L stop, which we're trying to integrate the notions of community information and transportation. Because, you know, we all know that the car is an evil. The car is going to really do us away, especially in an urban situation. But one of the problems that lots of us have, no matter how much we know that, is we say, but we don't know where we're supposed to go. We don't know how you're supposed to get there. So what we're trying to do at this station is instead of a place that you come in and out of, it's a place that you become informed and educated through. And this has been an interesting project because, as the chart up here talks about, everybody is always talking about developing consensus. And what we've discovered in this process, consensus is the diversity of the community. And what we've also discovered is that there's some power in that. We can, we can really get some happy and cheery people together, and as long as everybody's going to get a piece of what they need to have. And I think that's another very important thing that we've learned through our work through the years, that you have to find those hooks. What are the things that you can learn from people? What are the things you can enable people to have some help in how to organize themselves? And then how do you take that material and organize it in a way in which you educate people from the point of view of what exists and what are reasonable steps that they can empower themselves to participate in the community so that in the end, the project isn't something that arrives from outer space in a spaceship, but rather is something that's evolved through the efforts of the community. And one way to start to do this is you have to realize there's always money to build parking garages. There's never money to build housing. So in this particular project, there's a quite an extensive UMTA grant, that's the Urban Mass Transit uh, Agency. And we're taking the design for the parking garage and making sure as we design it that rather than the car is always consuming us, that in fact we have a chance that that garage can begin to be transformed to other community uses through time. And the community is very interested in this because they're a little sort of skeptical about a 600 car parking garage landing in their neighborhood. So they really are starting to buy into the whole notion that the parking garage begins to give them some flexibility for the future, especially in that we've um, taken it and put it next to a high school where half of the open space of the high school had been paid for teacher parking. So now the teachers will be parking in the garage and the land will go back to being green space. These kinds of strategies go in the, the, the thing of, you got to know the rules that groups are doing. What are the regulations? And how do you take them and organize them to make what something is a little bit of a vision out for? It's, a, it's not subversive, it's just knowing how to make the best use of the available things that you have before you. Now, similar to this, I have a really wonderful student, Tanuja Yashi, who's an Indian woman, who does these kinds of thought processes in like a half hour. And what I saw as I was putting this talk together is this is Tanusha's idea of how you take a, uh, an interchange on an inter uh, uh, tollways. The one that this is for is out by I-355 and 88, which is in the west part of Chicago. And how do you make it into a place to sell and get rid of cars? She did this as a part of a half hour sketch project. A half hour sketch project. So I, being a sort of social engineer at heart, had this wonderful thought of marrying Tanusha's process 
with the incredible kind of images that Pinard generated back in Paris in the early 1870s. And if you put that kind of power of process and the power of image together, you really can start to take a leadership position in terms of the kinds of connections that the Kimball Station Project and information is trying to do. Now, this project or challenge has to be is a little more difficult and a little more political, if you will. It has to deal with hype versus reality. Um, you know, every day in the news we hear about another fire. Like just recently, the tragic fire striking through Malibu, or an earthquake, or a flood. Um, at the same time, recently in Chicago, they announced this project out in Schomburg. They're trying to find a heart in Schomburg. It's sort of like, I guess, trying to find a needle in the haystack. But also, it's this sort of belief that you'll see in some new traditional town planning that you create, if you create it, they will come. And I think the dilemma here is there's a lack of a sense of where the place is and what the power of that place is. Whereas with the fire, with the scorched earth approach, we do have a place to begin again from. But we don't let learn our lessons. And I think that's what I would like to share with you that I think is very important. We have to find a way to take advantage of the opportunities. A group of ADPSR people after the Oakland fires, I guess it's now five years ago, came out with a series of revised standards of how to build on the hillsides of Oakland and Berkeley, which were totally devastated by the series of fires they had. And it was like simple things like, what do you build the buildings out of? What are separations? What's the character of the landscape? Da, da, da. None of it was followed. They just built everything back exactly the way, just waiting for it to happen again. We've all been familiar with enough stories about floods in this area where whole communities will be wiped out and nothing exists any longer. So what this then has to do is we need to look around. We need to find where this kind of community building can occur that represents recognizing what the strengths of our community are today. This is a project that we've been working on for four years. It's built around the fact of a school as a strong social generator in the neighborhood. It's Noble School, that yellow school right up there. Good school. We have uh, local school councils and schools are now the new community organizers of our area. But the, the children were being shot as they walked to school. The red lines show the, the firepower because all of the buildings around the school in pink were in fact vacant buildings that were controlled by gangs shooting across each other through these three-story buildings and the like. The community got together. They, working with us and a series of other groups, created a series of programs called Young Builders. And we actually started to turn the young people who were shooting into young people who were building. And we created, at this point in time, a group called Young Builders. It's currently known as Student Builders. It is a small school program currently in two high schools in Chicago where they're building building components for reconstructing housing in the community. And they're getting ready to have four schools in the area have this small school program. Small schools are within the school, there's a, a program where students have the opportunity to work. A very appropriate form of technology because what you're doing is you're working with the youngest people available to you. And there was a green project at the same time because we worked with the mothers and their primary concern other than the safety of their children was how can the community begin to become green where it was asphalt? How can we begin to introduce gardens in which they can begin to grow their own uh, crops again and cut down on their own food supplies and things like this. Now, one of the other things that I really think is important are precedents. I've shown a few as we've gone along, but I had the opportunity this semester Tony Hiss, one of my students, out on Randall Road and uh, Roosevelt Road, west of Chicago, found something called Mooseheart. Mooseheart is 300 acres. It's a totally sustainable community built in 1919. Its whole purpose is raising children. And it's, it's about serious architecture and commitment. It's about a fascinating program in terms of the type of activities that are concerned. And here's the site plan. 
in terms of collecting all of this. And it's got a rather interesting identity where the, depending upon where the children come from, from their original families, the districts of the plan are organized to that. There's an internal circulation system that combines them all together. And you get these kinds of small villages based upon either where children came from or where, in fact, uh, what type of age they are. But I was struck not only by the fact that this deals with a lot of the sort of social sets of, of areas that we're working daily with in Chicago, but within minutes of my community, in 1919, this was built. The same student, as a part of this digging around for precedent, found a youth home two miles north of this that was built on 600 acres of land, which was a farm community built in the 1909, which over the years has now been transformed into a prison for young children that averaged the age of 12 years of age. But they still own all the land, but they don't farm it anymore because they can't find anyone to work with kids to farm the land because when it was founded, there was actually a rail spur that came all the way out to it that brought people from the south side of Chicago, from rural areas of the community, to this remote location and taught young people from the city how to farm in a reasonable way. That rail track has been rolled up and abandoned. Now, what were fields around the buildings now has you know, wire with wire and wire with the wire all the way around it. But from a point of view of, of a lesson for us all, it's very important to look back to the precedents of the past in order to see the kinds of patterns of activities that would be helpful to us. Finally, I'd like to sort of return to something that I did when I was here last. And this is a project called Try and Farm. And this happens to do with the challenge of ecological development. Try and, as Emily gave a little bit of a brief description of it, is a 200-acre piece of land in Michigan City. But the challenge, I think, is represented by these two little cuts. We're going through an interesting thing right now in Chicago. There's a great guy named Steve Packard who has sort of pioneered the reintroduction of prairies in uh, the Chicagoland area, primarily in Cook County. And in recent months, as, the, these, the, as they come closer into some of the neighborhoods that have been established and try to start taking some of the land that was prairies and now is in third and fourth uh, succession woods, and bring it back to prairies by cutting down the trees. We have the prairie people fighting the tree people. And at the same time, I have a belief that most of the tree people are represented by the slide on the right, that they're the ones that are driving downtown and then at the same time are arguing that we really need to keep those trees because they're the only things that are protecting us from the smog, rather than most of them live immediately within some of the best rapid transit and mass transit in the area and would, God forbid, ever get on it and take it and support it. So with Tryon, you try to work to create a kind of environment to bridge this gap. It dealt with land stewardship between the young and old. And for those who were here 48 years ago when I gave this talk, this was, was called the Will and Polly Show. Uh, this is Will, Polly Noonan and Will Werner. Uh, Will is only the third, second family ever to settle on the land. And Polly is a member of the family who is developing the land in the next phase. It's a 200-acre piece of land just off the lake in Lake Michigan. It has 18 different ecosystems because it's a part of the Doolin uh, system, which is a fascinatingly complex kind of environment. We've uh, restored uh, the ecological wetlands. We've replanted the prairies. And we've begun building the houses. And at the same time, all of the sewage and utilities uh, are being dealt with in the constructed wastewater wetland, which you see on the right. Um, to the students from this afternoon, that's what a constructed wastewater wetland looks like when it's grown. It's kind of hard to see it from the, the larger uh, prairie farms. And so we've been able to inhabit the spaces and begin to view the landscape from within the buildings for the first time and begin to see the miniature and the interconnection between the the prairie and the wetland and the houses themselves. But more exciting is the next steps of trying, because we formed basically off the kind of energy that I thought came out of the work that Natural Building Quicklin did last year. We formed something called the Triumph Farm Institute, which is a not-for-profit group in which we've started building with students, design build projects at small scale throughout the project that are represented in these two slides. This one being uh, a small project for a lily pond and the other being a small shelter uh, on the site that's being built with farm workers who 
work for one of my partners in Mexico who have come up and uh, are living currently in Chicago, but because they are, all come from a tradition of uh, village builders in Mexico are working on the property with us. More interesting, I think this starts to open some ideas in terms of the tactics for the future, in terms of how do we deal with the lands that we plundered already. Two of my students are currently working on projects that address this issue. Bart Cardinal from Holland is fascinated with the large dumps that are built all over Chicago. We have more mountains around Chicago. I, I remember when I was a kid, there was a big ad campaign for Folgers Coffee. It was called, The Mountain is Coming to Chicago. And for like eight months, everybody was sitting there figuring out, what the hell are they talking about? The mountain's coming to Chicago? What is it? You know what? It's actually there now. There are nine of these large trash dumps around the site. And Bart became fascinated with the whole idea of how do you program one of these trash dumps? How do you organize it? And what is the kinds of things that can occur on it? And the one little drawing that he has up there that just struck a real good chord in my heart is up there by the picnicking. He came up with this idea for a grill that's based off the methane that comes out of the mound. <laughs> I told him he has the patent and he could retire on that kind of a concept. But these are kinds of things I'm encouraging the students to look for in these types of ecological restorations. How do you make use of what you see around you? How do you get things done with what that is? And how do you do it over a period of time? And finally, there's the other great thing that we have, especially up in Chicago, is the quarries. And what did these quarries become other than being filled in and made into trash dumps or mountains? And again, I return to my young student, Tanusha, who came up with the concept for an ecological seminary. Cemetery. This is a one hour sketch problem. God forbid if she ever went to Washington and took over the government, she might actually organize things. Really, a, a true talent in, in terms of the spirit of organization. And that's one of the things that I want to leave with this whole thing. I believe more and more as young students, what you're going to be involved in as you move out into the world is how to begin to organize these diverse factors that are involved in architecture, planning, and landscape architecture. It's not straightforward anymore. It's not clear lines. Things are all cross-cutting. And you've got to start to trying to develop the skills and talents to do that. So as I close, I'd like to just walk through a series of lessons that maybe all of us can share. Chicago with its grid is a man-made pattern. A much more interesting thing is not only to look at it by itself, but to look at the soils map of Chicago underneath and step back for a moment and only wonder what would the plan of Chicago have been if we would have made it reflect the soils of the community beneath? In Bern, Switzerland, there's a project called Silid Holland. I've known it for 35 years. Only recently have I begun to discover in my mind that it was probably one of the earliest sustainable communities that was built. But most important that I want to share with you as a fact in this discussion is that, you know, if you look at the plan of the community you live in and you begin to build for the future, you, if there's real lessons in where you are. And I think that's why I'm so strongly beginning to remember when I say, I am Chicago. Holland is there. It couldn't happen anywhere else. People have tried it, and it, it doesn't succeed for a variety of reasons. Similarly, I'm really fascinated with the sort of notion about, in Chicago at least, we're really into the 1890s. If any of you have been back lately, we've got 1890 light fixtures going up left and lot right. State Street Mall is being redone to look like the 1890 uh, mall, uh, street. And, you know, I'm more interested in the 1890 maps of the region. Uh, this map over here, 1886, shows the regional scope that transit took you as someone who was living in Chicago. You could take a ferry from Benton Harbor to downtown Chicago. So that the sweep of Chicago was an arc all the way around, and the lake just happened to be something in the middle. If you look at the Burnham plan, he also recognized this, and always in his overall regional plans looks at it as an entirety. And the same other thing is to remember that some of the clever things that were done by the city fathers of Chicago when they planted it. They created those pieces of property called canal lands. Those canal lands, in fact, are things that funded the construction of Chicago because they were lands that were set aside for the public good of the community. We can't forget those lessons either. We have to bring back setting aside public good rather than private good. 
You have to learn to use appropriate materials and appropriate methods at the right time. Um, that's the Empress's yacht in Peking. One of the five buildings that sort of stretched my brain for a while. It's all made out of marble and it's floating on this lake. Um, there's some really good things about it to remember and know and learn. And this is from uh, Russia in 1968, wandering around a bookstore. I found this thing that the Russians, because they knew they had to build a lot of housing, had already started thinking about how they could use blimp technology to install it faster. Well, there's something to be said by looking back and forth between both of these in terms of what are the materials and what are the means, what's appropriate at the times, and what are the social and environmental issues inherent in each. I would also sort of in my mind like to move on to something that says that maybe function should follow form. Um, I found these cards in Switzerland and it's, it's amazing the way the Swiss want to tell you about the mountain and then you take a photograph as a tourist of what the mountain looks like. The form to me is much more interesting than the functions the Swiss want to tell me that's going on in that place. Yes, these are the mysterious photos from the announcement. And I'm really sort of interested in that it's okay to have a difference. But we've got to remember to have harmony. But it's most important to really learn to express your opinion. I think that one of the things I've learned by spending time just looking around, and especially more back by being in school now, is that opinions are, people are nervous about having. And I think it might go back to what Alinsky was saying about words. I think it might have to do with self-confidence and how to begin to develop that kind of self-confidence. But also recognize that sometimes you do have to compromise your opinions. But at least you make your point of view of where are people things can happen. People know how to talk to you. And as being the generation of the matrix, more and more I'm becoming the generation of the Buddha diagram. Because rather than having this kind of structure where we're looking at order and then there's diversity within it, it's very interesting with the Buddha diagram to deal with harmony and the diversity within it and how we can see that a point of view expressed in both of these and how those two ideas begin to merge. But most importantly, let's all have a vision. Let's all choose a mentor carefully. But most importantly, let's just remember. Um, 
I think probably it has to be that our, any of us, education is not done in a vacuum. Um, my education was in the 60s. Um, there was a series of forces going on that shaped me deeply, made the thought of connections much differently, perhaps, than the students today. Um, we were talking in studio the other day, one of the students was beside himself because he, he just couldn't come up with a solution, and so he talked to a jury. And I, I said to him, you know, I really don't have any sympathy for doing that, because I remember when I went to school, if we failed, we died. And so I have, come, bring anything. There's no failure. You can just have a scribble on the piece of paper and say, I had this light brain last night and it was this. But this whole issue of risk and reward, uh, also the times. Earlier today, Scott and I were talking about uh, the whole issue that perhaps we're all, we're, we, we just hear too much, we're becoming desensitized. We're, we're not becoming personally involved anymore because whether it's a risk or, well, I've heard that every day I read that in the paper. I'm just tired. Of it. I don't know what to do with it. I don't know what to do with it. So, I think also that the issues are much more complex to communicate. Um, that's one of the reasons I tried to, to work on this presentation a little bit tonight. I'm on the board of directors of one of the largest social service agencies in Chicago that serves 122 communities. With the welfare reform, which uh, welfare dictates, um, suddenly we have to rethink what it means to provide for residents within the communities. But more importantly, what is the character of a social service agency, both physically as well as programmatically, because of those changes? Because no one has thought through those systems. It's a very interesting board because it's a church, a church, a Methodist church, and several of the people on it are from the suburbs. And the other evening we were having a conversation, and it was about the public housing issue that we sort of led off with. And they said, well, why don't we read about any of that in the paper? And I said, well, probably because to get from A to C takes six New York Times three-page I mean, just overwhelming. And there's probably maybe three of us in this room that read the whole six thing all the way through, even though we're all maybe concerned about it or interested in it. There's just, there's no way in the soundbite world that we live in to just get about it, to get into it. And that's why I've become very interested in these small scale projects that I was showing with the students, of finding a way that they can touch something and get immediately involved. I really like the small scale projects that the, uh, Neil is doing with the young students, getting them involved in building something tangible in their community. It's not high rise, it's not housing, it's a totem pole. It's painting a flyer plug. And it, it might seem facetious and say, well, so what? But when you see a world where everyone is stepping back, to start to see a place where people are starting to step forward, that's a really important thing. And that's why I'm constantly challenging my students. And I use that word challenge. It's up to you to press me. Because it's about your future, not mine. And whatever I can do to help you, I'll be here until 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, Sunday, Saturdays, and whatever it takes. But you've got to come to me and ask. You've got to come and participate. You've got to come and demonstrate to me that you're not just doing this to get a job at SOM. Because i got news for you. Working at SOM sucks. Okay? It sucks. It's dehumanizing. Humanizing. It has nothing to do with what you've all been trained for in this school. It's an incredible environment you're going to. Don't be recruited. Don't be fooled. Choose your own life. You can do it. There's such flexibility out there. Emily introduced me to this student that she met up in the Hopes Conference. And the guy came to me and he said, well, Emily said, blah, blah, blah. So we had lunch and we sat and talked. And it turned out he lives in the village where we're doing the master plan. It's kind of funny stuff. And he says, I said, well, so where are you going? I'm going to Chile. You're going to Chile? What, what, what's going on in Chile? Well, you know, on the way back from Pope's, I was driving through this mountain town, and we were looking at brochures in the, the little shop, and I saw this, saw this thing about Knowles, the Natur National Outdoor Living Society or Center. Like, and he said, there was this great thing about going and climbing the Andes. So I said to myself, I want to go climb the Andes. He said, well, 
I said, well, what did you do? He said, well, then I called up and asked how much it would cost. $7,000, they said. And he went, rather than going, thank you very much, he went, so um, how can I maybe uh, do that? Is there something I can give you? I'm an architectural graduate, da 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 Bottom line, he's in Chile now. He's volunteering for three months, building a center down there, a Knowles Center. After he does that work for three months, he gets to go to do the climb, and then he gets to go back to the place and he gets hired for three months to work on it. That's the new job. That's my role model. Not somebody that says, gee, can I buy an expensive suit and go work at Skidmore? And they get fired as soon as somebody wakes up, you know, and they realize that Soldier's Field is really going to sink. You can't build Soldier's Field 30 feet lower than the lake. That's what they're talking about doing. And no one steps up to the table, even at that level, and says, uh, excuse me, how, how, how do you make that boat uh, float? Because we've all been taught something. We've all been taught to be polite. So that's why I was really encouraged today when the students were sort of arguing with me. And Darren was nice tonight and said, gee, I hope I didn't ruffle your feathers. And I was like, man, stab me right here five times and it would have felt terrific. It's a long answer. Hope I answered it. Anybody else? Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you.